Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I want to first thank you for this opportunity to have this presentation. It's an honor to be here today. Uh, my name is Katri Lansivuori, as Nigel just said. And um, my background is in acute care. And is my mic working properly? Okay. My background is in acute care and operational field management, where I worked from 2001 to 2014. And after my postgraduate studies uh, in social and healthcare management and development, I started working in South Karelian social and healthcare district, so called Exote, as a project manager. And there I have been developing home delivered services and the interface between home and hospital. Uh, can I see my slides now? Oh, I have to press here. Hey, yes, now it's working. <laughs> In October last year, uh, I transferred to 2MIT uh, to work as an account manager. In my presentation, I will introduce to you an integrated service structures with new type of service models and a new way to use the patient data and other available information. So like in almost all developed countries, changes in the social restructuring cause challenges also in Finland. Senior citizens have more often several health conditions and due to them multiple different needs for service and care. Up until now, the strategies and management of healthcare organizations have been based on models that provide large output of volumes and control and calculation of budgets and increase in regulation. In spite of this, the cost of the systems continued rise in almost all countries. In response to the failure of these traditional methods, we have developed an integrated value-based system and moved from hospital and institution-based models to more home and customer-based models. Areas started from municipal-based structures and continued merging them in bigger municipalities and social and healthcare districts. Integrated care is an entity of well-organized service processes that create a customer-centric ecosystem. The focus in integration in Finland was on removing administrative and organizational borders uh, between municipalities and their service multiplicity, between social care and health care, and between primary and secondary care. The reform gives customers more freedom of choice and by doing that also adds their responsibility. Social and healthcare service system, from customers' point of view, it's more like a service net with private companies, relatives, public sector and so on, giving the services, providing the services. Only by managing and developing these services as an entirety, all together, we can improve the availability, quality and efficiency of the whole system. The total cost of the social and healthcare sector in Finland have been reduced by deconstructing of institutional care and by developing home delivered services. By mobilizing the work and by coordinating, it's possible to avoid the usage of overlapping resources and at the same time prevent any unnecessary bouncing of customers in the service system. Along with good financial outcomes, also customer satisfaction has been improved. Uh, with the help of digitalization, contents of services are improved, as well as services' ability to allocate to individuals. 2MIT uh, is Finland's biggest publicly owned a company that provides ICT services and solutions for social and healthcare service providers. Over half of the Finnish public sector professionals uh, are our customers and also owners. So 2MIT is a tool for them to achieve their goals. Technology as an absolute value does not solve anything. The question is how we are able to use the technology as a supporting matter, enabling autonomy of our citizens and autonomy of our professionals. Uh, this slide looks the same as uh, Sir Andrews, doesn't it? 
So I'm not going to repeat the same that he said, but something else. So, so uh, South Karelia Social and Healthcare District, so-called Exote, uh, is an excellent example of a fully integrated social and healthcare service system. Uh, Exote produces health services, family and social welfare services, services for senior citizens for the whole area of South Karelia. Exota was established in uh, 2010. Uh, nine municipalities in South Karelia agreed to integrate their services into one organization. Decisions have been made cost-effectively, focusing on the big picture, instead of just implementing optimization that focuses on the parts of the organization separately. Overall costs of Exote uh, have dropped by 2.9% if you compare it to the level before. Exoda strategic goals and the vision for the challenging organizational change bases on the view that home is the best place for everyone. Hospital care is usually the most expensive solution to society. Also the risk of complications such as thrombosis and infections multiply during the traditional type of hospitalization. In Exote, uh, releasing from ho the hospital is abled 24-7 with the home hospital service and virtual post-releasing follow-ups. In South Karelia, only 5.6% of over 75-year-olds are in long-term care outside their own homes. Many of the services are delivered home by various professionals and in addition, the help and care given by relatives and by voluntary sector. In Exota, there are more physiotherapists and occupational therapists than in any other public healthcare actor in Finland. With home rehabilitation and service need assessment, Exota has cut the cost from the use of services by 30%. Uh, the integrated Exota model has had a strong influence on the ongoing social and healthcare reform in Finland. I will go through six examples from Exota. In this slide, I have the first three ones. So last year in Exeter, the nurses made uh, 60, over 68,000 remote visits, meaning 5.7% of the contacts made in home care were remote. In euros, this means 500 euros per customer per month. We have an ongoing pilot with new type of medication robot uh, made in Finland. And right now, 20 customers are testing it, piloting it. And we believe that 36% of our home care customers in South Karelia uh, could benefit from it. And the counted savings are approximately 1,000 euros monthly per customer. Well, in the future, the field of expertise working outside the hospitals will di diversify and progress. We started a coordinator role and integrated its function with ambulance service situation rule. Uh, they are additionally trained nurses and they are situated at the ER next to the specialized level doctors that they can consult anytime. Uh, with the help of the coordinator, we can uh, sort of target human resources outside the hospital to the needs of the clients and make the use of different professionals more efficient. Uh, so the units are monitored by the coordinator, and you can think the coordinator's role as coordinating know-how. Uh, there is no my patients or your patients or neither mine or your tasks. Information must be at hand quickly and collectively, making the evaluation more comprehensive. Uh, before starting this service, uh, 2017, this group of customers often encountered first ambulance service, paramedics, emergency duty, and finally they were admitted to hospital. Now approximately 70% of these interventions are treated more customer-oriented and more cost-efficient. So the fourth, fourth example is a MOPSI app, so that we don't talk only about elderly people. Uh, it's an example how a digitalized and integrated service can be used from preventive perspective and to rehabilitation among the children and juveniles. 
also the data from MOPSI is collected to uh, integrated patient data. Fifth, we have the safety at home concept uh, with the rescue department of South Karelia. Exota and other partners have delivered together. Uh, we have noticed that well-being and safety intercolorate together. So by improving the other one, uh, also the other one is affected positively. It's important aspect when the future services are more often delivered home, and home can be even seen as the smallest social and healthcare property. So safety at home is a multi-professional network where situational awareness, risk profiling, and the risk management of housing is improved. Unfortunately, we only have the public assessment tool in Finnish that you can see in the blue letters, but we are getting the international version soon this year, so you have to go and check it also out. So my last example uh, is South Karelia's new type of healthcare center. Uh, in South Karelia, the 11 traditional healthcare centers have been transferred into new type of welfare centers, meaning that the perspective has changed from only treating sick people with diagnosis to preventive work, social services, mobile and electronic services. The centers are low threshold services, so you can either go there, call, chat, or then use the e-services platform to connect. In, foundation, the, in, in South Karelia, the foundation of the development is an integrated information pool. We develop and manage with transparent information about effectivity and expenses. All the professionals in integrated social and healthcare districts in Finland use the common patient data, meaning everyone from dental care to hospital wards to home care have up-to-date information and overall picture of the customer. Customer management and uh, development management levels con collect data from different source systems from different users. Data can be uh, used based on customers' allowance, in real-time service situations, and by using algorithms and artificial intelligence, also serving customer groups to predict illnesses like uh, diabetes or social uh, problems like, for example, unemployment. I'm sorry that this slide is quite complex, but I wanted to put it to my presentation so that if you wish, you can study it uh, further afterwards when you get my slides, hopefully. Uh, but I, now when I heard uh, Sir Andrew, I think you like this one. <laughs> so Finland is among the leading countries in the electronic data management. As a small country, we aim to nationwide solutions. Data of EHR, meaning customer data, is stored in the national operational archive called Kanta. You can access Kanta anywhere in Finland, and the users of Kanta services are social and healthcare services and uh, providers and, for example, pharmacies. Uh, you can browse your own data uh, and decide what is shown to professionals. Also, you can check your prescriptions and, for example, appointments and lab test results. The data is extremely well protected, and with the Kanta information, um, your information is always up to date and available for those who have the permission to go and see it. The mobilization of services uh, has created many new needs and challenges for technology from the perspective of digitalization. Our customers can so choose many kinds of technologies to help them. For example, meal automat, medication robot, virtual visits, remote monitoring, and so on. The challenge really has been that you might have many apps that collect data from certain area or certain features of your life, but nothing brings it together or analyzes the data. 
So the new platform uh, that is being developed this year is a digital tool that collects data from different source systems, analyzes it and serves, serves it uh, to the needed parties, customers, relatives and service producers. Three of Finland's 18 areas are now piloting it. So we hope that uh, 2022 all the areas are using it. Social and healthcare reform makes our customers more responsible of their own care. <clears throat> customers and relative caregivers are raised to the center of these processes by giving them more freedom of choice and responsibility. <clears throat> we have to make them also owners of the, their own information that concerns their health and well-being so that they are able to make responsible decisions. The improvement has required value-based management, the involvement of professionals and customers, training, educating and continual dialogue. And my last slide. In every encounter, regardless of service channel, the aim is to comprehensively evaluate the need of services, to understand also the overall effects of, for example, nutrition, medications and loneliness, and to extensively take care of the customer's needs. Procedures and actions don't follow the profession's old rules or unnecessary limits. The goal is to get the right know-how to the right place at the right time. In integrated organizations, all the customers are common. In spite of these positive outcomes, we are still on the first step and lots and lots of work to be done. I'm more than happy to discuss these matters with you and I really warmly welcome you to visit Finland, of course. <laughs> As Henry Ford once said, coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress and working together is success. Thank you. Good. I'll come to you first, Kate, is that right? Yeah? Yeah. I'll come to you first. Yeah. Great, thank you. Come and join us, uh, Katri. So um, let's get some reflections from uh, uh, two bits of, uh, of the country okay. who are also thinking about some of this, this issue about how to broaden out services, how to connect services together. Um, some of you will be very familiar with some of these ideas. I, we should, I'd, I'd forgotten Sam was going to be here. People will have heard about his model, which has got many resonances to this. But tell us about Wigan, Kate, and, and how, what you've been doing that complements that, but maybe even takes it further. Well, thank you very much, Nigel, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Katri, I'm a huge fan of Finland, and a lot of what we do in Wigan actually reflects Finnish practice and, and practice in Sweden, too. Um, our whole approach to prevention, which we call the Heart of Wigan program, um, is a single prevention program for the whole borough. We call it Heart of Lee in Lee. That is actually quite important <laughs> if you come from my neck of the woods. <laughs> um, and it's based on the whole societal, whole system approach to CVD prevention pioneered in North Karelia, so uh, part of, obviously part of mm. Finland. Um, and that works incredibly well because what we've done there is uh, utilised uh, a whole societal approach, engaging all our citizens in CVD prevention from the tinies, so we do things like CPR and health improvement training for CV, C, CVD in our primary schools. I've got eight-year-olds who know more about heart disease than I did when I left medical school, so that, that's a sobering, sobering effect. But the point about that is actually engaging all citizens and empowering all citizens in health is a very, very similar, I think, approach to, to the one that you are, are talking about, Katri. I also saw a lot of similarities in the way in which we have approached health, social care, and wider public service mm -hmm. integration in our borough. We organised the borough into what we call seven service delivery footprints, which are based on the 14 townships across Wigan and Lee. Um, so recognisable geography to our citizens. From a, a health service perspective, they're 30 to 50,000 populations. So when we're talking about in the LTP about uh, primary care networks, it's the same population size. The difference in Wigan is that we organise the whole of the public service around 
the, those footprints with the anchor institutions being schools and GPs. The two points in the, pop in, in the uh, community which have registered populations and are often dealing with separate, uh, the family, uh, the, the adults are obviously uh, usually seeing the GP, the kids are usually being seen in the school, but normally there isn't a conversation. Now there is. Uh, police, fire, this broader public yeah. service that you were talking about, housing. Uh, I have leisure uh, under my portfolio as a, a director of public health. Uh, I'm also chief emergency planning officer, but I won't go into Brexit. Um, <laughs> the, the, the point about having leisure under me and having some of the, green, uh, the important green spaces is that very much like the Finnish approach, we're able to build in leisure services and that physical activity offer right into primary care. So um, Inspiring Healthy Lifestyles, there is a clue in its name, inreaches into our uh, practices to make sure we've got people who want to engage in physical activity and have fun, by the way. It's not just about going to the gym. It's about the kind of outdoor activity you were showing in your slides, getting out, doing walks, having fun with your family and friends, because actually that's why people want to be healthy. So sort of slightly going back to Andrew's presentation, I think, the, I think we sometimes forget that actually about getting older is not necessarily about getting sicker. What we're aiming to do is extend healthy life expectancy. And I'm pleased to say that mm. in Wigan now, women in Wigan uh, achieve the average healthy life expectancy for England and the trend is still upwards. And in most boroughs, you will, see, you will be uh, seeing a reversal of that. Mm. Men have got a little way to go, but they, they're about to reach it. So my aim is not just to extend the life expectancy of the population, but the healthy life expectancy, and that's the outcome we should really focus on. So for ex we, we've adopted Marmot, and I think the approach you're describing really, uh, I think, really reflects Michael Marmot's start well, live well, age well approach. We've added dying well to that as well, because you, yeah. we want you to die well in Wigan Borough as well as live well. Uh, quite important. The quality of dying and the dignity of dying is actually mm. really important. Like you, and I was really encouraged to see the way in which you described the model for both rapid response and prevention. Um, we have recently um, organised our services around rapid response and uh, admission avoidance, which is specialist nursing, social care, housing, mental health, all working together with our ambulance services. And since the community rapid intervention team came into place in August, we have saved uh, and avoided 9,000 plus emergency admissions to the acute sector. Really important difference. Uh, we know it's working, it's getting a better result. Over what period was that case? Since August. Since August. Since August. So, you know, really quite a rapid turnaround in, in demand management. What I'm interested in is your cost savings. So I'd be, I'd be really interested to see if that uh, also plays out as, as that model goes forward. The, the other sort of preventative end is around our multi-agency huddles, which happen on a weekly, sometimes daily basis in our seven service delivery footprints. And the people who attend that are not just primary care, which, uh, you know, in the way that Katri describes, it involves all the wider agencies. So housing's there, leisure's there, police, fire service, and the way in which, uh, I think a practice manager described it beautifully for me by uh, going back to um, one of her senior partners and saying, you know that hour and a half I've just spent in the huddle? And he was expecting a complaint, I've got to say, but he didn't. She said, that's just saved me 18 hours work because of the quality of the intelligence and communication and the fact that we're actually dealing with complex dependency in a, in a very different way. So those, Nigel, are, are my sort of early thoughts about the way, um, you know, the similarities, and I'm actually encouraged that we're actually on the same, very similar mm -hmm. journey. I think perhaps <laughs> what might be interesting for Finland is, is the way in which we've mobilised a social movement for change in Wigan. I now have over 23,000 citizens out of my 323,000 population who are engaged in some form 
of community health champion work. So that goes from our young health champions, which uh, involves a number of our high schools, and also all of our public service apprentices across every agency in the borough, through to de dementia friends, autism friends, in mind champions, cancer champions. What we do is to hook people in on their interests, provide them with training. This is the council doing this, by the way. Uh, using uh, things like the Royal Society of Public Health Level 2 qualification and then keep them networked. The amount of volunteering we get is amazing and I think is reflected in things like uptake of screening, which we achieve all of our national screening targets, uh, uptake of IM and VAC, we achieve above national targets, particularly in MMR, interestingly, mm. and the reduction we've seen in things like smoking prevalence. Smoking prevalence in Wigan, ex-mining working class mining community, 15.6%, so the England average, routine and manual class, 25% England average, and the lowest in Greater Manchester. That's citizen engagement for you. So I think it, you know, it's a, 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 a sort of north of England version of, uh, of Finland, and we would like to learn more from Finland. Thank you. So Thank you, you probably ought to visit Wigan, is the actual conclusion. <laughs> uh, that. I, I, we are a bit cl closer than Finland. Uh, it's it's closer. I, I, I have visited Wigan and it's well worth it. I haven't got to Finland yet, yeah. so um, thanks for that. We'll come back for questions and comments from the audience in a minute. But Kira, do you want to talk about South, South East London? Yeah, yeah. Um, so perhaps, um, well, firstly, we get why everybody in Finland is so happy. Yes. Um, uh, uh, now, perhaps a slightly different angle. Um, so thinking about what, the Finnish model is brilliant there, what, what sits around it, which is where a lot of our work focuses, what's that broader aspect, so some of those broader determinants of health that can sit around models, models like, uh, like these. But based, I think, on a, uh, I saw a real sim similarity with how do you put people at the centre of things, and specifically, how do you reduce that distance how do you reduce that distance between those who are commissioning services or in our, our uh, space funding services uh, and those people who are consuming them uh, and are participants uh, in them? Um, just to put a bit of context to, uh, to, to the comments, uh, so Guys and St Thomas's Charity, no particular reason you've heard of us, um, alongside supporting Guys and St Thomas's Hospitals, we're an urban health foundation. So uh, cities have distinct health challenges. Um, they emerge from, you know, population density, which cultural and ethnic diversity, high levels of income inequality, uh, and, and that often plays out in uh, particularly marked uh, health inequalities. And we focus on those. We focus on uh, what can you do to solve some of those urban challenges. And for us, it's for a combination of research, testing out interventions, but also deep community uh, engagement. And perhaps that's where I could, perhaps, uh, where I could kind of reflect on some of what I heard uh, uh, from your from your presentation, particularly about kind of the how of local local innovation, um, drawing drawing on that, I mean, the the first and um, uh, just kind of place in context. A lot of our work uh, focuses on the issue of multiple long term conditions. It's one of those really interesting issues. To take thirty seconds on it, it's one of those really interesting issues that seems to hide in plain sight. So, you know, eight million people across the UK have three or more long term conditions, uh, but. The topic only gets a handful of mentions in the NHS long-term plan. Um, and where in our work we see that although long-term conditions is often kind of associated with ageing, in South London we see that one in three people who have long, multiple long-term conditions are under the age of 65. But what we really notice is the variation uh, in people's journeys into multiple long-term conditions and how that seems so influenced by social factors, by where people live, by their income, by their ethnicity. So we see, for example, uh, the local black communities in South London start their journey into multiple long-term conditions about 10 years earlier than other communities and progress to having multiple long-term conditions much, much quicker. And the reason I go into, go into that context is that when kind of focusing on the local uh, uh, innovation side of things, one of the things we've learned is that often kind of the energy in the system isn't necessarily where you might be able to make the biggest gains on population health. So uh, taking, for example, multiple long-term conditions, we think probably the biggest gains to be made are focusing on how do you slow people's progression down from having a long-term condition to a multiplicity of them. The energy in the system is often a lot more around uh, uh, age and how, how do you manage complex care uh, management. Um, 
something uh, that we've learned in our work, very similar to, to yours, is, is about how do you combine and leverage the kind of a collective value of data, uh, but also evidence and then user insight. And how do you use all three of those and value them equally? So using data to think about where, do you, where and whom do you target, uh, using the evidence to think about, well, what sort of intervention should you use? But the, the user insight for us feels really important for how do you take something that might work somewhere else uh, and really address it to the context of people's lives? How do you start with where people, people are, on, are on things? And I think the third that kind of uh, really uh, uh, struck me from, from your work, uh, a kind of a resonance for ours, is this idea, this kind of, uh, uh, this phrase from the RSA I quite like, of how do you think like a system and act like an entrepreneur, yeah. which feels really important in this, uh, in this space. So, so how do you set a, a system orientation? So for us, that's uh, how do you slow down progression to multiple long-term conditions, particularly for those who are at risk of moving through, through it fastest? But how did you use that as an orientation rather than to directly say what has to sit within that? So within that orientation, how do you test lots of different things, which is where a lot of our work focuses? How do you test things either on their own or for us? How do you work out what combination of things do you have to do at the same time to, to have an impact? So to give a practical example, we think that, uh, uh, that agency connectedness are going to be critical uh, uh, for um, slowing down people's progression to multiple long-term conditions. So we're testing out community pilots, community living rooms, to see, well, what works for this, what, what doesn't. I guess the question I'd leave for Katri, uh, and interested in everybody's perspective on this, is when you're kind of working in that sort of system space, which, which, mm. which we are, is God, just how hard it is, um, the mental bandwidth. Um, uh, of it. Um, we often kind of use the, the analogy of uh, the difference between uh, flying a plane and flying a helicopter. So flying a plane, the engine stops, the plane kind of wants to fly. Flying a helicopter, the, helicopter, uh, the engine stops, the helicopter falls out of the sky. Um, and it kind of feels like that on working on these issues of complexity, just how much work uh, it, a mental bandwidth it takes to keep holding all of those things uh, in your mind at once, and in particular, how do you kind of how do you deal with the fact that to try and motivate and convene action, you have to come up with some quite simple narratives uh, on things and some silver bullet answers when we know through the mm. work you're doing all the work that you were talking about in, yeah. in, in Wigan that the, the, there's not one there's not one thing exactly. Great, thanks, Kieran. So we've got an opportunity both to ask questions, but I'd also encourage you to tell us about your local initiatives and experience that would add to this rich picture. Um, because isn't it interesting how much convergence there is both internationally and across uh, different types of systems in terms of how people are thinking? Catherine, do you want to comment yeah, on that? I, yeah, I was just thinking that. Can I say one thing uh, for you? Uh, I'm not going to lie, it has been extremely difficult to turn the minds of our professionals. And especially if you think about the, for example, operators like surgeons, mm -hmm. that they are used to having the left knee that they are worried about. And now they have started thinking like uh, then The whole uh, bone. Oh, this oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <plus. laughs> yeah, but you understand. So now they have to start thinking like, how can I uh, get the home rehabilitation and, and uh, do the homing next day or something and, and think about the wider picture, it's not easy. Yeah. <laughs> Still. Good. I think I saw a hand up somewhere as John, and I can't see I can't see who that is, but there is a, definitely a hand there. The light is, uh, is it Jeremy? Yeah. John, do you want to say who you are? And... Uh, John Wilderspin. That's it. I do all sorts of different stuff now. Um, including uh, reading about this stuff, and it is, th this has been so refreshing, because uh, I spent 30 years in the NHS uh, with policymakers trying to tell people how to do this stuff, and picking up Kieran's point, this is, this is all about human behavior. How, 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 do you, how do you focus on individuals and communities and tap into things like schools, as, as Kate said, as a center, rather than always thinking it has to be about health uh, and the health service. But that's, that's the biggest block. It's a mental block. It's not a policy block. Yes, yeah. um, and one of the blocks which is now coming along, uh, and I was picking up Katri's uh, point about money. So um, mm -hmm. there's 
there's been far too much emphasis on saying, if we only move stuff out of hospital into communities, we'll save a shed load of money, with a lot of lazy thinking about that. And now there's a pushback, which says, actually, there's no evidence that if you move to a community-oriented system, you'll save any money. Some of that driven, I think, by vested interests. So I was really interested in your point about, actually, I think you said 2.9% yes. savings. Yeah. Now, it, it, sharing that and really diving into that would be, I think, one of the most useful things that we could do in policy terms. So I look forward to it. Good. Thank you. Who is that? Is it Jack? Can I comment? Yeah, do you want to just comment on that and then we'll come to Jeremy? Yeah, uh... yeah, I was just going to say that 2.9%, um, that, uh, uh, you have to think it as like the whole service entity because you can actually add money, you can pay more, for example, in rehabilitation or some community services, they cost more and then you, like the total amount is dropped. Yeah, you understand. Yeah. Kate, did you want to comment on that? Yes, I did. I think that's a really helpful point, John. I think I, I'd like to just reflect to you that um, the whole Wigan deal approach, as we call it, uh, which is, is the different conversation we have between ourselves and our citizens, plus the investment we put in our citizens, was the council's response to austerity. We've had to save over £131 million pounds out of our revenue grant. That's just been taken out. Uh, so it was actually fundamentally transforming the way we think. That changed the nature of the conversation. We now have, with our health partners, a single, uh, it's about, just about to, get, about to go live in a few months' time, a single Section 75 agreement, which covers most of the council's social care, um, both adults and children's, public health, leisure, housing, CCG revenue spend, in a single, uh, a single pot, with a joint director of finance and a single integrated commissioning arrangement, and we have one of the few balanced adult social care budgets in the whole of England with the ability to put investment into social care. And we shifted investment upstream into prevention, early intervention. So not only have we had to save money, but it's made us think about how we use the, the Wigan Pound, the collective Wigan Pound, in a wiser way. So maybe there are a few lessons there. And, and just to reflect on John's view, of the, I mean, the, the evidence that um, simple substitution for community of yeah. is, is pretty poor. Uh, and that's because you're not defining, I think the lesson from this is you have to look at the whole system and you're thinking about savings in terms of allocative efficiency as much as you are about uh, actually releasing ca cash. So I think there's a, uh, we're insufficiently nuanced. Um, the switch to there's no evidence at all is also not true, but it illustrates a, a very intriguing tendency of the, of the debate in healthcare to swing from one mad extreme to the opposite without any intervening nuance. So um, uh, th thanks for that. Yeah. Hello. It is Jeremy. Oh, yes, it is. Jeremy Hughes from Alzheimer's Society. Excellent. So I'm a great believer in the opportunity of remote support and technology, and we've now got a de dementia technology group under the department's dementia program. The downside is the reduction in that social engagement and that human contact that's important for people. However, in terms of experience, I think one thing, and we've been involved with, with Wigan and elsewhere, is that through the Dementia Friendly Communities Programme, I think there's a real opportunity to, to engage other people in providing that support outside the usual health and social care community. So the Fire and Rescue Service, yeah. uh, we're now working with the energy companies, so that the people who do meter reading and even smart meter monitoring to provide support. Uh, working with one of the supermarkets so that the people who are doing home delivery don't just deliver the bags to the doorstep, but actually take the food into the kitchen, put it in the fridge and check what else is in the fridge. So there's a lot more that we can do, I think, across the community. Um, I wanted to pick up on Kieran's point, though, and I think it's reflected elsewhere, is that um, it's about getting people willing to do things in a different way. And the question I have is about training and I suppose more, even more so culture. So how do we get the training in place? So we know, for example, in domiciliary care for people with dementia, one in three people working with people with dementia in domiciliary care don't have inad inadequate dementia training. They have none. So there's a problem there. But the bigger question, I think, is about how do you change the culture across health and social care to make different approaches and the value of different professionals increase relative to the perceived historic value of others. Question. Do you want to respond to that? Karen? 
Good. We'll leave. We'll leave that. Yeah. Did you want to say? Something? Yeah. 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 Hi. Uh, hi, Jeremy. And, and and fantastic. The work we've done with the Alzheimer's Society has been brilliant. And you know the 15 dementia-friendly communities we've got across Wigan, and the I think it's uh, 15 plus thousand uh, dementia friends across the borough. It, wide range of individuals, other citizens, frontline workers who are engaged in that. You're spot on about the the training. Uh, OD, HR and IT have been absolutely the key enablers of the Wigan deal and we put every single member of staff through anthropological, ethnographic, deal-based training. Uh, that includes all of our frontline health and social care staff. We've just done a version of it for clinicians, which is dead helpful. And we put people like our bin operatives through it as well. A lot of them are trained as dementia friends, so they can spot problems really early in the way that you're describing. That's then reinforced through my time, which is our performance management route. Every single person has to go through deal training. That includes senior managers like me. Just because I'm a doctor doesn't mean to say I know all about health improvement. There's always something you can learn. Uh, and it's also reinforced through our recruitment and retention policy as well. So we now recruit for behaviours. Be positive, be courageous, be accountable. That's what we want people to be. And that extends to the way in which we work with our social care providers. So we've certainly worked on things like ethical home care frameworks and the, um, with our social care, private social care providers, the kind of support we give to social care staff to make it uh, care workers uh, be a valued part of the system. So we mm. offer training and development to them as part of our responsibilities commissioners. And the, um, I mean, the culture piece is critical. I, I think it's really interesting what we think of as the system. So, so absolutely uh, culture within health, health and care, but it was really interesting, Jeremy, how you were talking about the system being a much broader thing. So you were talking about supermarkets there, for example. One of the things that we find in our really kind of locally based work is, so uh, another issue we focus on is childhood obesity. Now, one of the major drivers of childhood obesity is what's sold in convenience stores and corner shops. Um, now, we notice in this work that once you broaden the system to think about, well, who are the owners of those corner shops and convenience stores? They tend to be people who live in the communities most affected by childhood obesity. So how do you kind of tap into that piece of the culture where actually all those corner shop owners are, uh, are motivated by this issue? We haven't quite yet found a way of speaking, speaking to them putting them into the business camp rather than concerned parents who now understands the role that they can play in dealing with this local issue. So culture, absolutely critical. I, I sometimes think that we need to broaden our sense of uh, what we think the system is like, like you were describing. Thanks. I think there's a comment here. Yeah. And then there's a one here. So um, go there first and then come forward. I'm yeah. Suzanne Rastrick, the Chief Allied Health Professions Officer for England. Um, I have a parallel life in the housing sector and from very early on in my career. And I guess I still continue in that sphere, and I've been dabbling in some of that in some of our policy work in NHS England. But could I just have the panel's views on what do you think in terms of system levers we could do to incentivise our relationship with housing colleagues? We share the same citizens and communities, and there's a great willingness on, on housing partners to, to support and do things in terms of social justice, prevention, etc. And yet we singularly fail to, to drive on, on that agenda and make a, make a success of it. Thank you. We didn't actually. We heard. We didn't hear much about housing in Finland. Does it come up as an issue that um, that need, who, do they need to be, people who look after housing need to be brought into your model? Do you want? To, is yeah. Some? Well, usually they are private companies that do that. Yeah, but it's integrated, of course, as well. And do you find that they're collaborative and, and work well with the the rest of your bigger system? Yeah, I. Th think so, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so this may be a UK, a bit more of a UK yeah, problem. Um, yeah. Kate, did you want to reflect on that? And I'll come to you, Kieran. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, uh, thanks, Suzanne. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, uh, if you th look at the origins of modern, I I'm going to go back to mid-Victorian era here, modern public health in this country, housing was at its heart. And I think we lost the connection in 1974 when public health moved out of local government into the NHS. We've now, very, I think, re-established it uh, in a much better way. Locally, what we've done is to actually bring our main um, social housing 
provision back into the council. So it's now back under council control. So the, if you like, the 23,000 most at risk households are actually council tenants. So working with our uh, tenants associations and, and the, uh, communities is absolutely part of the, of the deal process and they're seen as integral to the integration agenda around well-being, health and social care. Interestingly, we've put housing not where you might think it would go in the council, but under the director for adult social care and health. Mm. So he, he and I have the Great. person yeah. approach to housing policy. And I think that's been incredibly powerful. So within our SDFs within our multi-agency huddles, housing officers are absolutely integral to that and they're working directly with primary care and directly with secondary care as well. We've also uh, re revamped the whole of homelessness provision and uh, um, the Mayor of Greater Manchester came to, Andy Burnham, uh, came to actually open our a homelessness hub in Lee. And a little plug for my uh, 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 soon to be released public health annual movie, Home is Where the Heart Is. It's all about homelessness, housing, and sustainable communities. So you might want to have a look at that when it's released in a couple of weeks' time. Good. Well, miss the Oscars. No, yeah. um. <laughs> that's yes. That's yes. Um, uh, brilliant, brilliant question. Uh, three, three thoughts um, on it. So one actually just on our work on multiple long-term conditions, one thing we found is just how difficult it is to identify people who have multiple long-term conditions. Doing quite a lot of work with housing associations around that. So particularly in a very diverse area of London where we work, GP registers aren't always great at identifying those people we're most most interested in are housing associations uh, another route to that building on that one of the things that we that we see in particularly in some of the forward thinking housing associations kind of is tying together a shared purpose around how improving residents health leads to kind of fewer voids uh, uh, and, and the like, and how could we build on that? I mean, to the point, um, so perhaps, Nigel, this is one for you, but, you know, we're an endowed organisation. We have a charitable endowment. We actually started to invest some of our charitable endowment in those most forward-thinking housing associations because we think we can see a very clear uh, driver of health there. So maybe, Nigel, one for the Nuffield Foundations I'll, I'll as well. Have, yeah. I'll think about that. Yeah. But, uh, look, we've, we've got uh, quite limited time, so I'm going to ask people, I'm going to take three comments quite quickly if we could. So there's uh, somebody here. I can't see who the light is in my eyes. But uh, then there's uh, Martin and Sam, and uh, then we'll see how we get on. Yeah. And okay, uh, Imelda Redmond, I'm uh, from Health Watch England. Um, can I just say I found this morning really, really refreshing and what's, what's uh, um, consistent across all three presentations is about really engaging with your populations and bringing your population with you and actually uh, inverting the power balance so that the, hand, the power is back in the hands yes. of the people that make the change. I, I was on a panel yesterday with Donna Hall, so I feel a bit immersed in, uh, in Wigan. I think you're doing a fabulous job. Um, it's, it is time consuming and it is hard. So yeah. with all the STPs and ICOs really getting to grips with very complex change, what would you advise them to do to take their first step around really bringing the, the population inside the tent? Right, well, hold on to that thought. First Gosh, step, yes. um, give you a little time to think yeah. about that. Martin. <laughs> at, uh... Uh, Martin Marshall, I'm a GP in East London and uh, academic at UCL and uh, uh, vice chair of the Royal College of GPs. Um, from a policy perspective, trying to integrate care really is a, a, a frustrating uh, challenge. Paradoxically, on the ground, it's actually quite easy. Um, mm. Mm. We're doing uh, a number of evaluations of integrated care programmes in, in East London and have done over several years, and the findings are, are very consistent. There's three major impediments to effective integrated care. Um, one of them is, is constantly changing structures. Uh, one of them is the large number of temporary uh, and locum staff uh, operating in the system. And the third one is a lack of time for people to have to build meaningful relationships. So it is all about relationships, as you've discussed. And it seems to be all three of those things are things that policymakers could do something about if they wanted to. Thank you. Good point. Uh, Sam here. Mainly a question for Katri. Um, if you look at activity a percent of activity of ambulance and fire brigade services, about 80% ambulance of their time they're active, fire brigade 7%. My question to you is to what extent are you engaging the fire brigade service in particular 
uh, in healthcare, as we see mm -hmm. increasingly happening in the, um, uh, in the USA. And in particular, any thoughts you have, because we're thinking about integrating the commissioning of ambulance and fire brigade service in London. Any thoughts you have on that? Thank you. I think we've got time for just one more. This lady, lady. I'm here. Okay. Thank you. Well done, Lydia. Yeah. Very Thank fast. you. I'm, I'm Linda Thomas from Macmillan Cancer Support. Right, Linda. Um, and I, I just wanted to say it's been brilliant this morning. It's got, kind of given me hope, actually, again, which is quite nice. Don't worry. Thank we're you. going to work on that later. <laughs> <laughs> so, um. um, just a couple of points, really. I think, like Jeremy said, um, Macmillan is also engaging in many different schemes like this. So uh, we are doing work with three or four ambulance trusts across the country. We're working with corporate partners and uh, we've got a community, some really deep planning around community schemes. A couple of observations on the things that we've probably seen where that you have to have in place to make these things successful. Um, thinking about the bandwidth that is needed, investment in program management, which doesn't always sound terribly attractive, but the schemes that we, we've seen which have worked the best have always had a tenacious program lead who is not doing that job as well as doing 500 other things, but is dedicated to doing that. Um, there's something about being prepared to play the long game. We don't always see results from things in year one, so you've got to play that long game. And then echoing everybody else's points about relationships being absolutely key, building relationships, telling the stories, engaging and re-engaging seem absolutely critical. Um, and maybe just an, a last point, which is we're all doing this work. How can we best learn from each other so that we just don't do it in a vacuum? Yes. I've had a tweet from someone who says, however, we shouldn't fall into the trap of saying Wigan is fantastic, we should all be like Wigan, I think. Is that would Precisely, you, I yeah. would say that, yeah. Wigan is different. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. My parents live in Pinner. They're actually from yeah. Wigan and Bolton, but it still yeah. wouldn't, uh, they would need a different model for where they live. Yes. Yeah. So let's um, pick up a couple of those, uh, uh, those challenges. Some of them were just comments, but um, the, I think the, the, I gave you a bit of time to think about the, the first challenge there, about how to get started, and I might come to, to you on that. Do you want to? Yeah. As well, yeah. yeah. Okay, do you want to have a go at that? How to get started? I think just picking up from Nigel's point, I think this is this is the this is the crux of the matter. And it was when I was talking to colleagues in Surrey a couple of weeks ago, I made this point. This is not about a one size fits all uh, top down model at all. When you want to, if you are, are genuine about engaging with the, the community, you need to understand the history and geography of the place and its culture. And that's incredibly important. And I think we forget that as sometimes as scientists. The humanity of the place is really important. And it's about creating the narrative. So for me, where ICSs can really get into talking about citizen-led public health and citizen engagement is about understanding the narrative of the place that they cover. And it might be several places. So um, that's why, once, uh, you know, we have, what we've done in Wigan is to create a narrative, a story with our citizens. And it's one of the reasons I produce public health movies instead of a boring report, which only the geeks will read. I actually want something that is part of the history and the culture of the place and which local citizens actively co-create with me. Mm. In fact, I don't write the recommendations and, until I've seen what they've said. So yeah. that's really important. And maybe ICSs could start to get into that kind of storytelling with their citizens. That's the way in which you change the power balance. Respect the area that you're, you're actually engaging with. Now, it might be around... I hesitate to say around a disease issue because I think sometimes then we get back into clinical pathways. I think it's much more about um, creating a narrative with the population about what does success look like in terms of a healthy population? What, is, what will motivate us to be healthy? And I can guarantee most citizens would say, hope, confidence in my future and the future of my family and community and having fun with my family, friends, mm -hmm. and loved ones. It's not about, um, you know, sort of A&E, four hour trolley weights in A&E. That bothers us. That's not what bothers the citizens we serve. So I think getting I into that, a bit of storytelling. I find that highly important. implausible, but still, never mind. <laughs> Very good, that, excellent. Um, quick comments yeah, from yeah, Kieran yeah, and just, 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 just on, on, on that one. I guess sometimes it's helpful to think about what not to do or things to be careful, careful about. So 
I guess one way of thinking about this is how do you bring people into the tent? I, there's a risk. There's a risk within kind of bringing people into the tent. So just talking about work on multiple long-term conditions, we've been doing a uh, work with the uh, Richmond Group of Charities, looking at how do people talk about multiple long-term conditions. And actually, people don't talk about their individual conditions. They talk about moments of complexity, moments of loss. So I guess the risk that we need to avoid is that when we bring things into the tent, we put them back into those individual conditions because that's how our tent's been, been, been set up. So things to avoid is, I, I guess we need to think about actually what framing are we giving when we're trying to bring people uh, into conversation with us. Katri, you get the last word. Yeah, because uh, we all know that this traditional model, we can't afford it. We all know that. And I know that uh, government and leaders and doctors, they believe numbers and evidence. So that's my first step. <laughs> Get some evidence and then <laughs> and go and start. Evidence also discussing. works. Yeah. Relationships really important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of these, we're going to pick up some of these themes uh, later. This is a good moment for me to remind you that you have evaluation forms in your pack that we're very keen that you should complete. You might want to complete this bit section now before you go for coffee, which is what we're now going to do. We'll get you back here, if we may, at five at eleven fifty-five for the resumption of the session. But could you? Please join me in thanking our panellists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.